Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Clarity's webinar, uh, where we're going to be looking at uh, the next normal uh, as the media world and tech sector seeks to return to work after the COVID-19 crisis. We've got an amazing lineup of uh, reporters and editors from major international media outlets here to discuss how the media world has changed. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sammy, founder and CEO of Clarity PR. Uh, and I'm here with our panelists, Amy Lurin, Danny Fortson, Harry McCracken, and Patrick McGee. Uh, for those of you who've dialed in to join us this morning uh, or this evening, wherever you are, uh, you'll see that at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there's an option to ask any questions. Uh, we can't promise that we'll be able to answer everyone's, but we will definitely take a selection at the end. Uh, do keep them short and to the point if possible. Um, so uh, before we crack on, um, it'd be great for um, our uh, panelists to briefly introduce themselves. Amy, do you want to start us off? Hi, I'm Amy Lewin. I'm the deputy editor of Sifted, which is an online publication that covers startups and tech in Europe. And I'm based in London, so I'm the sole European representative on the panel. Thanks, Amy. Danny. Uh, Danny Fortson, I'm the West Coast correspondent for the Sunday Times and uh, host of the Danny in the Valley podcast, uh, creatively named, I know, uh, here in San Francisco slash Oakland. Harry. I'm Harry McCracken. I'm technology editor for Fast Company. I'm based in San Francisco, and Fast Company covers the intersection of business, innovation, and technology. And last but not least, uh, Patrick. I'm Patrick McGee, so I'm the sole Canadian on the panel, I suppose. Uh, based in San Francisco, I cover Apple, um, US technology, a lot of hardware, so autonomous vehicles, drones, um, some other things. And I moved here in the summer from Germany, where I was covering automotive and uh, industry for three years. Thank you, guys. Um, and thank you all so much for taking the time to, to join us today. Uh, I know you have super busy schedules, so we're very grateful to to have you with us. Um, so I thought we'd uh, get the ball rolling initially with a fairly kind of uh, general open-ended question and then see where that leads us. Um, as you know, the subject of this uh, discussion is what we're calling the next normal in journalism. Uh, and I was curious, beyond the kind of obvious, uh, the fact that, for example, you can no longer convene in a newsroom or attend a tech conference, um, what, if any, fundamental ways of what are the fundamental ways in which your jobs have changed since the pandemic? And do you think any of those changes are likely to endure uh, once we come out the other, uh, other side of this? Uh, Patrick, maybe you want to take a first. I mean, this is a very personal thing, but I've, I've basically had to turn nocturnal to get any work done uh, because we have a 21-month toddler at home. My wife works full time and we don't have a nursery. We haven't. I think this is week 12 now without a nursery. So I sort of had to become a lot more efficient. And, um, you know, it, it depends on how you work. But I mean, some people can work in short bursts. And I'm just not really one of those people. I, I need to focus if I'm working on a long term piece. I reread my lead over and over and over. And sort of if that works, then things fall into place. So often I feel like I just need hours of uninterrupted work. And, uh, you know, at 2 a.m., there's nobody emailing me. There, there's no toddler crying. Well, I mean, not always, but sometimes. Uh, so, yeah, that would be the biggest thing. Um, and then just in terms of like for, for PR, on the PR side of things, I've become sort of a lot more uh, demanding, um, you know, having to say no to sort of freewheeling conversations. I'm sort of a lot more interested in what the thesis is. Does the person that you're representing really contribute? Um, would they... Would they be the lead example for my piece? Um, I get too many too many emails just about someone could could talk about an issue I recently reported on, and, and usually that just doesn't meet my bar anymore. So I've sort of had to raise the standard, um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 I think that's quite likely to be something that I'm um, that I'm learning and, and will take for the long haul. That um, I'm just sort of more demanding and want concrete, tangible examples up front rather than just hoping that out of a forty five minute conversation I might find a tidbit somewhere. Fascinating. That's a great insight. Danny, I know you have a couple of young kids. Uh, I assume you're also dealing with similar childcare considerations. But beyond that, are you also, is, has the bar risen for you in terms of the kinds of conversations you're prepared to, to take? 
Yeah, I mean, everything uh, Patrick was just saying just is, it was, you know, we're leading parallel lives, it seems like, because I have a three and a half year old and 18 month old. So it's, and also no child care. So again, it's, um, my day now is divided into shifts of, you know, two hour chunks between my wife and I, who also works. Uh, and in those two hours are gold. So I, do, I can't really afford to waste time on a conversation that is kind of, beside the point really of what I'm working on. Um, so I do think there is, um, yeah, that is, that is, you're having to be a lot more ruthless. And I do think that will probably endure um, because also you just realize how much of your time is wasted with useless phone calls <laughs> um, or was. Um, and then the other thing, just on a, on a more practical uh, level, you know, a lot of journalists know how, the Sunday Times works or whatever paper they're talking to works in terms of their deadlines, when they need to get back to you by. And I still think that that applies. I've had a couple of times recently where, you know, you put in a request for comment or a response um, to a story and be like, look, I need this by the end of the day tomorrow. But they're like, well, I know the Sunday Times. They actually don't need it till Saturday afternoon. And I'm like, well, if you're doing that, it's too late because our whole way we're putting the paper together now is shifted. There's a much less wiggle room. So, you know, deadlines in a way have, have come up and our ability to just like dive back into pages and insert a quote or whatever, it's just all much more difficult because everybody's working from home. There's very few people in the office. And so just the kind of making the sausage has changed that process. So we have less room for kind of last minute changes. And like, those, like I said, the deadlines have been shifted up. And I, long term, if we ever get back to some kind of normal office setting, that may kind of go back to normal. But for now and for the foreseeable, we just have a lot less room um, for messing around, especially as we get closer to deadline. Interesting. Amy, are you seeing similar things in, in the UK? Not really, because well, we're a much, much smaller team than anyone else here. Um, and we're also a much newer publication. We've only been going for about a year and a half. So everything's always been a bit in flux for us. We we're always kind of slightly changing things. So if anything, when it first happened, it was kind of, it was, we, in a way, we had a really, really clear mission um, that we maybe hadn't always had because we had, the world of European startups were like, what the fuck is going on? All the investors were like, what the hell is going on? And we were the best kind of, we were ideally placed to be putting together stories about what was going on with different kind of government support schemes and things. So for us, it was actually kind of quite a good sort of focusing activity. Um, and the kind of working remotely thing, you know, we don't, we're not putting together a physical paper. So it, it's not been too difficult um i mean apart from all the all the other kind of personal challenges and remote you know remote working needing to over communicate all the time but in terms of actually kind of how our editorial works not really interesting i don't think it's just the european startup ecosystem that's asking what the fuck is going on uh, they're not alone in that um harry um what sort of fundamental changes have you experienced if any and I'm maybe particularly interested in your perspective on how audiences and readers, um, uh, 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 how they're consuming media and how habits have changed on that front. Well, um, the huge change for us is that around the start of March, it suddenly became obvious to us that we should devote close to 100% of our energy to covering various things relating to the pandemic. And um, that percentage is still really high. Like three months later, it's uh, it's still about ninety percent of what we cover. And they're not all. A lot of them are stories about health, but we're also talking about how the pandemic is affecting startups and um, consumer electronics and all the other topics we usually cover. And that's the first time in my career, at least, that we've suddenly on a dime shifted from trying to cover everything to having a focus that in some ways was a little bit outside our comfort zone. And um, one of the reasons we're still doing it is because it's, it's quite obvious from our traffic that there's a great hunger for stories about this topic. Um, people seem to feel that we're a trustworthy source. 
And while we are doing maybe 10% of our coverage on other topics, those stories are not getting the, the kind of traffic they do in normal times. And so, um, you know, readers will tell us when and how they want us to shift back to, to normal, but um, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen anytime in, in the immediate future. Danny, are you seeing a similar thing, a kind of um, audience side demand for exclusive, exclusively pandemic related technology stories, or are you seeing a kind of a growing appetite for a different conversation? Uh, so, so, I mean, we've had, it's kind of a, there's a few answers to that. So we've had record traffic to the website. Um, and I'm sure that's the same for probably everybody on this panel. We've had record just like it's through the roof traffic. Um, and it's also interesting, um, cause you have record readership, but also record low advertising. Um, so, you know, in the physical paper, for example, which obviously leads to the website, there's no ads. And so you actually have more space to fill than normal just because the physical real estate um, is not taken up by, you know, the usual big ads we have, you know, here, there, and everywhere. Um, so kind of anything COVID related and that same thing on the podcast, it's like, you know, if you have, it depends because I feel like every story is a COVID story at the moment. Um, but some just really, if they're really about like, how do we get out of this, um, contact tracing, that kind of stuff, people just seem to not get enough of that stuff. Um, but I think people are also getting a bit weary of it. It is starting to be become a little bit, not background noise, but it's just kind of this thing that is here now as opposed to this new scary, oh my goodness, what is happening to the world? So I do think people are starting to shift their interest a little bit um, into stories that aren't maybe directly about it or a bit, you know, take their mind off it or, or you know, look at it in a different way that isn't, you know, the sky is falling. But generally, uh, you know, it's still kind of the only show in town um, in terms of traffic and what people are reading, you know, the top, two, three, four, five stories are usually about COVID. But every once in a while, you'll now get like, oh, I'm going to just read a profile about something that has nothing to do with this because I can only read so much. Yeah, I can identify that. Could I just jump in? Because, sure. uh, you know, the, the two terms that I sort of came there, uh, you know, somebody's talked about the hunger for these stories, but there's also the fatigue of these stories, right? Like contact tracing is really um, interesting and it's going to have a, a, a lot of stories written about it over the last few months. But I mean, I think our whole publication just has contract tracing fatigue, right? Because basically, because it's happening on a worldwide basis, basically every journalist had some relationship to contact tracing. And it just seemed like every story was about contact tracing for a good two weeks. And that was even before Apple Google launched, um, you know, their, their, their protocol. So, I mean, there, it, what, what I find difficult to juggle is, yes, we're still writing about the contact trace or, or the coronavirus. And yes, there's still hunger for that. But because of the fatigue, you need to somehow be original. I mean, I'm so sick of leads that begin with something like, six months ago, everything was going well for Dave McClatchy. You're right. I mean, like, that was clear for everyone, you know? So it's like not an original thing to say anymore that things were going fine before this hit. That's just true for everybody. And so to me, that's the difficulty, which is like somehow, how do you, how do you, you know, balance the line between people actually really want to know about this, but you somehow have to be original because the experience that sounds unique is actually what we're all dealing with. And I'm sure we've all been bombarded with, uh, you know, requests from PR companies to talk about some company and how they've shifted to distributed workforce. And it's just like, guys, everybody's doing that. That's not a story. Yeah, do, do you, um, how, how do you feel about, um, I mean, as PR people, we obviously know that journalists are looking for COVID related angles. Um, do you sometimes get the feeling, Amy, that you know, the startups who approach you or the, the PR people who represent those startups approach you with stories that they've kind of, they've kind of had to try to shoehorn a COVID angle into their, into their pitch or even they've had their, their client, you know, build something or create something that um, is optimized for the pandemic world. How do you feel about that, that kind of, you know, behavior? So in the maybe two weeks immediately after lockdown happened in London, 
we were absolutely bombarded with um, like emails from PRs and from startups sort of letting us know what great altruistic initiative they were doing to help the help the NHS or help with contact tracing. Um, and I mean, a lot of them were just kind of like our food delivery service is offering, you know, free, free meal kits to NHS workers or whatever. But there were a few that were just really on the line. And I just... I just it just got to me one day and I just wrote a snarky op-ed about how like you just couldn't like you you cannot say that your kind of meal replacement drink you offering thousands to uh, the hospital workers in Berlin was like the best thing ever I was just like this please do not use this crisis as a marketing yeah um, but that that then kind of ended um, and now, and now the thing that's a bit annoying is kind of ev every single health tech company wants to tell me exactly the same thing about how they're helping transform the NHS or another healthcare service in, in Europe. And none of them seem to have realized that there are hundreds of them also jumping on board this amazing digital transformation that hospitals are seeing. And, and I'm like, I'm not going to cover you all. Have you not seen me? We've already done three pieces. Yeah, I imagine, yeah. I imagine all that. I've got, I've got a lot of. If I had a nickel for every email I got from um, a cannabis or weed company saying, <laughs> that, you know, "Oh, the use has gone through the roof, and this is the perfect way to like deal with stress and anxiety." I mean, it's just ridiculous. There's a lot of that shoehorning of like, "Oh, there's something we can kind of you know draft off of." Let's see, and a lot of times it's just very, very transparent. Yeah, that, Along is with the the third, that is the third category. Sorry, the um, our usage has gone up by five hundred percent. Email, a lot yeah. of them as well. Also, lots of stuff from people who make collaborative tools, um, and it's true people are using collaborative tools more. But uh, I've gotten dozens and dozens of those a, a lot from collaborative tools that don't seem to have a whole lot of traction yet. It, would you say that the? I mean, I know all of you are no doubt inundated with pictures from people like me every with every every hour in the day uh, would you say the kind of general levels of noise ha has increased or or dropped or, or is it roughly the same just a, a different kind of tone and message first i found that the volume was significantly down which was kind of nice and um it seems to sort of slowly be bubbling back up to normalcy i'm still getting tons of uh, pitches that are related to uh, COVID-19 and a somewhat higher percentage of ones that are unrelated as well, but still probably a little bit down from the average because I think a lot of people are, are smart enough to know there are stories that just are not going to happen right now and it's better to hold on to them if you can. Right. Patrick, I, I, I yeah, picked up on your point that the you know audiences are experiencing a degree of fatigue around COVID-19 related stories. Um, uh, are you f experiencing fatigue around COVID nineteen related stories? Have you kind of, as journalists, had a had enough of it and want to move on, move the narrative forward a little bit? Yeah, I have to say, maybe four or five weeks ago, someone told me they were experiencing contact fatigue, and I almost had like a judgment, a, like a judgmental reaction, like you know, this is such a big thing, you should be reading, because I was still full on, like you know, the, I don't know if anyone listens to the app Autumn A U D M, where they do long form journalism. Uh, but I mean, I was sort of walking the dogs for longer times just to get through more of these like really deep dives into COVID-19 at that time. And, and then, and then four weeks later, you know, like more like last week, it, it just sort of, sort of hit me that like, I'm, I, you know, I just go through, 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 through periods where I, I just don't want to be reading about COVID right now. And frankly, like something like the last dance, you know, like 1998, you know, Chicago Bulls, like just nothing to do with it. Like that's that kind of thing. has been a godsend, but then it ramps back up. Right. I mean, that's why I just say, like, it's not like we're uninterested or readers are uninterested. Um, I, I just think the demand has to be higher, that, that, that there needs to be something original. Um, and so, you know, the PR pitches that I get sick of are just ones that uh, I could think of one yesterday. Clearly, I won't name names or anything. But, but, you know, it was just someone reaching out with a line that, frankly, was great six weeks ago, but it's just, like, completely stale um, at this point. And, um, 
Can, can you elaborate on that without naming the names? In, in what way was it stale? Was it just that they... It was offering, I mean, I hate to go back to contact tracing, but that's what it was about. And it was basically, right. it was basically a point that, frankly, I had already made, other people had already made, just about how contact tracing probably isn't going to work. Um, you know, here's why kind of thing. It could do more harm than good. And we already put this in a 2,000 word piece that leave that alone, I sort of felt, was two, three weeks late when we published it. Um, so, you know, to come at this like a month later, you know, it just, it just struck me as ridiculously stale. And, you know, that's something that sort of sped up, right? Where like, I used to have a sort of like, I'll work on this two, three weeks down the road. You know, I could sort of have more planning capacity. And now it's like, I don't know what's going to be going on in two weeks. What I'm interested in now could have absolutely no relevance. Um, so, I mean, I do sort of start are fresh <laughs> on a lot of Mondays for the week, just because anything I thought about on Friday might might be, you know, not irrelevant, but you have to tweak here and there to make things relevant because it's, it's a fast moving story. I agree with that. I feel like the way we think about our more kind of like featurey stories has changed a bit um, because they kind of feel, even though we're moving away, probably that sounds like a bit more than everyone else from the pure coronavirus stories, still the kind of, well, a, a, we can't do the kind of, we went to this um, startup with a really interesting company culture and hung out in their office story because we're not allowed to go there. Um, but also they can just feel a bit kind of random. So we've moved, for example, Monzo, the digital bank has a new CEO. So a fun way we thought about covering that was we basically no one knew who this new CEO guy was like people hadn't heard of him so we did a kind of profile where we called up old friends and asked him what he's really like so it's more doing things like that like reacting to news with features rather than the kind of a bit more magazine-y style ones is, is a way we're kind of moving away from COVID stuff but doing those slightly more like analytical or long read stuff. Interesting on, on that sort of like the kind of practicalities of putting your stories together um, somebody uh, has asked a question online um, that they're really interested in understanding the kind of mechanics of interviews that you're, you're conducting. Are you tired of Zoom calls or do you prefer old-fashioned phone calls when talking to, to sources? Danny, do you, do you have a comment on that? Do you have a preference? Um, I would... Zoom for so, so um Present company excluded, I'm very tired of Zoom calls. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I do think long term, there's a there's a richness that will be lacking from stories the longer we can't actually meet people and see things and touch things and kind of get that first person kind of experience. Um, so that's something that I'm starting to kind of like, initially you're like, whoa, like I can do this all on Zoom and I'm getting kind of 90% of what I would get in person. Um, but over the long term, it just does feel like, uh, that, you know, there's only so much you can do. Um, that's, what's really interesting with video conferencing. Everybody's like, wow, now everybody's going to be video conferencing all the time. And I think that is something that is, it is a shift that is not going to go away. But I do think as the more we do it, we will start to re realize there are limitations, especially when you're talking about features colorful stuff where you actually have to go kind of go out into the world and meet people and see things and kind of get under the skin of things a bit and also just to that point on the kind of the broader question of like how it's you know the papers being put together and features and stuff i mean we have a pile of beautiful features just sitting over here which were all sidelined um two months ago and they're all relevant they're all as relevant or more relevant than they were before. But now it's like, well, what do you do with that stuff? So I know a lot of, there's a lot of frustration amongst myself and co my colleagues. You'd be like, work on something for a really long time, um, craft it, it's finally there. And then it's like, well, that's probably not going to see the light of day. I mean, that's part of just the way things go uh, in, in this business. But um, it's, it's particularly extreme at the moment. Um, and I think, yeah, the zoom the zoomification of journalism is like fine but i think longer term um it's it it would be good to get back to some be being able to actually get out there and talk to people and you know see stuff harry would you, I you that? I sorry go ahead i was just asking you harry whether you, you would echo that that sentiment um i am definitely looking forward to getting out and about in san francisco and visiting companies um in answer to your question, um, uh, while Zoom is great in some ways, 
uh, I like to record a lot of things just on a plain old phone call, um, partially because I'm taking notes. Um, the person I'm interviewing doesn't particularly need to see me. And also phone, I can, when I use uh, a phone call, I can reliably and easily record it, which I usually want to do, so I can go back and transcribe it. Yeah, got it. That's super interesting and, and helpful insight. Um, I, I wonder if we want to kind of like uh, sort of uh, take a kind of broader perspective and look at the overall tech industry and how it's, uh, in your view, has uh, responded to this situation. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, the for many years, um, quite rightly and understandably, the tech industry has taken a lot of flack. But now there's quite a lot of, uh, you know, uh, emphasis on uh, the tech industry's response to us actually as a society successfully overcoming the, the pandemic. Um, as a very kind of general question, how, how do you feel the big players in the industry have, have responded to the pandemic so far, um, both in terms of their, um, how, how they're behaving as companies, but more specifically how they've communicated um, over the course of the last several months? Um, Patrick, do you want to have a stab at that? I mean, I think it's really interesting, like the big four, you know, that are sometimes trillion dollar companies, they're basically Google accepted back to being at their pre-COVID peak, which is pretty stunning because, you know, I, th I think overall, well, Amazon's clearly, clearly just doing extremely well and will continue to do so. Overall, but I, I think even if you've got a, a shrinking economic pie, it's clear that the slice that they're going to take is going to be larger and larger. And we haven't even really seen much uh, M&A activity from them yet, right? But I think there's clearly going to be an opportunity. And, you know, the story that, that, that I've been following recently is the idea that Amazon might buy Zooks and, you know, PitchBook thinks they might be able to scoop them up at something like a 67% discount from their last funding round, which is pretty crazy. And, you know, on its own, maybe it's not that big of a deal, but I think it's probably representational of what we're going to see over the next 12 months, um, which gives rise to all sorts of antitrust concerns and so forth. Um, in terms of how they're actually sort of like, you know, playing the game of, of, of turning the tech clash into its opposite, um, that's a little bit tough. You have to go, I guess, case by case. I mean, Amazon has sort of tried too hard to the point that it's become a Twitter joke, right? Putting out videos that anchors are supposed to read, uh, you know, word by word, and, and unfortunately, loads of them around the country fell for it. Um, but hopefully the sort of backlash against that sort of turned out to not be, not be good for Amazon's favor. Apple is sort of continues to be a black box. Uh, it's impressive that they've come out with, I think, three different major product launches um, during this time, and they've done so without much fanfare, and yet their sales actually increased last quarter versus the previous year. I mean, granted by 0.5%, but, but even to be able to pull that off at all with retail stores closed around the globe, I mean, that's pretty damn impressive and indicative of how well big tech is handling this. Um, I don't know that I have deeper original thoughts on Facebook. I don't cover it, but there's, there's a lot going on there. So I'll, maybe I'll let Harry or someone else, uh, you know, take the mantle. Harry, Facebook? Well, um, in some cases, big tech companies have been doing the right thing. Um, Microsoft very quickly said that it would continue to pay its hourly workers, such as the cafeteria people, even though the campuses were shut down. And then the other tech giants followed suit. Um, I would say, though, that like there is not any evidence that the tech giants are going to save us. Um, there are certainly examples of them doing some good things in terms of providing data and tackling challenges, but um, the companies who help us get out of this are much more likely to be uh, the more classical health and medical related companies. Um, you know, they're the ones who will probably do things like come up with a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Danny, I know you wrote in uh, the Sunday Times about, you know, Twitter uh, making a statement that they would enable their staff to work from home forever. Do you feel like, you know, there's a kind of bit of bandwagoning going on and, and, and a bit of one-upmanship amongst the big tech companies to, to follow suit? Um, and to what extent are you interested in covering those kinds of stories now? Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of to Pat's point, it's like, you know, there's, whenever these like, new trends first kind of people wake up to it, like there's a whole rush of stories about them. And then it's like, okay, well, now what do we say? But I think it's, yeah, I do think it's interesting, you know, it was kind of like, 
who has the biggest, most amazing Technicolor campus with the best food. And now it's like, no, 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 you can stay home forever and ever. And we'll give you some money to set up your home office and whatever else. So the kind of the competition between big tech companies to kind of have the, the biggest, greatest offices now, you can, you know, who can be lavish upon their employees uh, the greatest opportunity to never come back to said office. So I think that's interesting. And, and there's all kinds of second order effects from that. But it's kind of, um, to the points that have been made already, it's kind of like, I can't write that story again. <laughs> unless there's some other kind of, you know, unless it's the story about people are starting to work from home and after two months they're like, actually, I really don't like this. I really want to escape my family or get into the office or the creativity that um, is involved in my work just isn't possible when we're all so distributed. Um, so I think it's, it's the kind of, there's this diaspora and now it's the kind of the dot, dot, dot of what is next. I think that's what's going to be really interesting because, you know, I think Shopify said last week, you know, the office is dead. Office centricity is dead. We're now fully distributed, 5,000 people. And maybe that works fabulously. Um, but usually with tech, they're like, you know, the, the reality is far different than the kind of the marketing. Cause they're like, well, we have Slack, we have zoom, we have all these tools and everybody can collaborate. And it's just like being in office. Well, it's like, I actually don't think that's going to, how it's going to be turning out ultimately, but we have to kind of see how that goes. So that's kind of what I'm interested in is the, um, the kind of what comes next now that everybody's, you know, spreading to the four winds. The sort of rebalancing. Um, mm -hmm. Just to pick up on something Harry said, uh, Amy, um, about, you know, in reality, whilst big tech will talk a big game about, you know, affecting the fundamental changes we need in order to just overcome this, this pandemic in itself. Um, I know you cover a lot of earlier stage companies and startups. Have you seen any activity in, you know, this with seed and series A backed companies? Um, any trends emerging that you're particularly excited about um, as we think about what a post-pandemic world might look like? Um, you probably have a somewhat unique perspective on that, I thought. Um, I mean, I think it's still a little bit early. If you, if you speak to any investors who have really got their crystal balls out even more than usual at the moment, it's all the obvious stuff like health tech and remote working is what they're they're looking for and, and speaking to all the way from kind of angel investors up to series A, series B, I think they are, they are definitely paying more attention to companies in those spaces. And I think if you're a, obviously if you're a travel company or you're a, some mobility companies and things, it's just really hard to make your case at the moment. Um, but it's a bit hard. Lots of the funding that's been going on there's probably been deals that were already in the works or their bridge rounds to keep companies alive. So I don't think they're necessarily indicative of, you know, what's, what's coming up. Um, I do think things like grocery, um, big, big boost there. That's still, I mean, the UK market is the most ahead in terms of online grocery, but there are really interesting food delivery, meal kit, all different types of companies across Europe. Um, and I think this this has really shown and, and it's really interesting culturally in different European countries, you know, like Italy and Spain are even more behind like Germany and France because of everyone's different food cultures. Like, you know, the, the Netherlands and the Nordics are a bit further ahead. I think basically like it's a map of like how shit your national food is against like um, how good your online food delivery is. So that, that's one that's had a, a, an interesting boost. Um, yeah. Danny, you, I know you uh, and probably Harry and Patrick as well, so feel free for any of you to chime in on this. But I know you're all, you know, based in San Francisco and close to a lot of uh, the VCs in Silicon Valley. Um, are you, what are they, how are they looking at, you know, 12 months from now? What are the uh, technologies that they're most excited about and investing in and talking to you guys about? Are there any that... Um, yeah, so it was funny. Um, I know a lot of people had a, a lot of fun with Mark Andreessen's um, blog post, which is like, build, now is the time to build. This is like World War II, everybody get together and like build new roads and skyscrapers and stuff. And then they got in this massive competition to uh, invest in a two-person app 
um, which is like a party line. <laughs> um, but, and so that was just kind of funny. It just shows that like, you know, there's a lot of like high minded nonsense, but at the end of the day, they want to go with something that's probably going to be software because that's the most scalable with the best returns. Uh, and one thing we've been talking about uh, with people, which is really interesting, is this idea of, you know, the end of the social media ice age, um, which has been kind of in place last seven or eight years where basically Facebook mainly and, and Google, YouTube to a lesser degree have either outcompeted or killed or copied anybody who tried to do anything interesting in that space. And a lot of people are talking about this idea that because our lives have been completely flipped upside down, we have all these new ways of living and emotional, psychological needs that suddenly need to be met. And of course, they're like rubbing their hands together. We're like, well, great. A whole new wave of apps need to get built um, to serve, you know, life, which is now different. Um, so I think there's a lot of excitement um, amidst all the kind of terrible news. There's a lot of excitement around this, that idea that, you know, there's this, you know, the ice age is ending. There's going to be a lot of new, interesting companies that could kind of come up out of this and, you know, with interesting ideas, effectively more apps. Um, <laughs> um, so for all that, you know, we, we have to build, build, build. Um, I think a lot of it's just going to continue as it has done in the past uh, decade, just, you know, plow into being plowed into software and apps that, you know, have a chance to go viral to be the next kind of big thing. Harry, is that, is that what you're saying too? All of uh, BC. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, certainly judging from history, difficult times are good times to build new things. Um, I think we saw that with um, you know, after the dot com crash and during the financial crisis. Um, the challenge is that it takes a while before it's clear what, what new things actually are going to pay off. And I think because this is still going on, it's a little hard to tell. But because so many existing companies are just scrambling to stay afloat, uh, if you're starting from scratch, um, you have an opportunity to get good people, some of who need a job right now, and uh, just focus in a way that's a little harder to do during good times. And you also, you tend to start off conservatively uh, and in some ways not taking a huge amount of funding from a VC is, is a great way to get going. Yeah. Patrick, there's been a lot of coverage about how, you know, in the last recession, uh, Uber and Airbnb and a whole bunch of huge success stories emerged from that situation. Do you, do you have a, a sense of, you know, 12, 18 months from now, what, what, what the kind of, you know, Ubers and Airbnbs of this pandemic might be? I think anyone who can answer that question probably can't be in journalism and just straight up be an investor. I mean, no, who knew that in 2007 that, that Facebook was going to you know, absolutely take off? I remember what an IPO being at the Wall Street Journal and another reporter saying, like, we're all going to be looking back at this in two years saying, you know, what were they thinking? This is obviously a dot-com bubble. This company can't possibly worth whatever it was worth that time. And of course, it's worth you know, 20 times that or something now. So, you know, I, 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 I'm skeptical of anyone who sort of has a cavalier arrogance of where we're going to be in 18 months. Um, I don't even think a lot of the stuff that we, that, that not we, but, but that are people talking about in terms of the lessons learned? I don't, I don't know how much of that. I, I keep thinking of my, my, my daughter who's you know, turning two this summer. And I'm thinking of like when she enters the workforce in basically 20 years, I mean, really, is there going to be any change because of COVID? I mean, clearly 20 years is just like a lot of things will be different as a result. I mean, I'm sure Zoom calls or whatever are going to be more part of the mix, but it's not clear to me that the coronavirus is going to have some lasting impact on whether she goes to an office or not, right? Technology in general might, but I think we're way too, um, way too, and sort of falling into the trap that, that, that today's normal bears more than a passing resemblance to the post-vaccine normal. Um, I, you know, I, I'm just more willing to throw out my hands and say, I don't know, rather than sort of, you know, have a real firm opinion of where that might be. But to sort of answer your question, one, one area um, that I do think is just seeing a ton of development is drones. And, and I keep writing about it, drones being unmanned uh, aircraft. And um, I mean, this is, this is a time when, when the regulators, the FAA in particular in the US, is, is really putting, you know, the pedal to the metal, as, as one source told me, um, in terms of uh, 
just getting them out there, right? Because drones, unlike autonomous cars, are not really a technological problem. That's really not what's inhibiting the technology from sort of flying over my house right now. Um, it's a regulatory framework problem. And in countries like Rwanda and Ghana, where they've allowed um, the, the market to thrive, I mean, there's literally thousands of drones flying every day, um, transferring blood and I think 160 different products from a single Californian company. Um, and I, so, so I, I just think that's an absolutely fascinating space um, and the fact that it doesn't require huge amounts of capital, huge amounts of original manufacturing, a lot of it sort of dumb components, batteries, just uh, augmented by software that more or less already exists. Um, I think it's sort of a, a, a major catalyst and we'll see a lot more drones. Uh, well, frankly, we've already seen them, so it's not even much of a prediction. It's, it's a bit lazy in that respect. A lot of this is already happening. Right. Yeah, it's a fascinating prospect. Um, we're coming up to the end of our... Uh, uh, our time. Uh, I've got a couple of, we might have time for a couple more questions. Uh, someone has uh, asked an interesting one. Um, given the extraordinary times we're living through, uh, that will go down in history, and the way that you're writing about it will form part of that historical record, is that a responsibility that you're conscious of? Who wants to go first on that? Big question. Danny? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the short answer is no, uh, because, uh, it, in other words, I don't like wake up and be like, uh, this one's going to make it into the history books. This, this lead on drones or flying cars, man, this is going to be, this is going to, people are going to be reading this in 50 years. Um, no, I don't, I, it doesn't change the way I think about any story. It's just like, you want to make it interesting. You want to make sure it's right. And you want to get your facts right and get good quotes and color and, and reveal something and, you know, all of that stuff. So, um, to be honest, yeah, I don't know is the short answer. It just, um, obviously they're extraordinary times and you kind of, sometimes you can't believe what you're writing, especially initially, but. Can I just take the opposite take? Because sure. it's allowed me uh, to ignore a lot of stuff where it's just like, you know, so we had a, 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 a note from our, our, our chief editor, uh, Rula Kala, who basically said, write stories now that in a year or two from now, when you're looking back on this, you're going to be proud of. And that just made me a whole lot more willing to ignore things where I was sort of on the line. Is this partnership, you know, which doesn't have money exchanging hands? Is this relevant? And I just think, you know, in a year from now, not at all, completely ignore and only focus on the big thing. So, so that's helped me. That doesn't mean that I think my work is this great stuff that's gonna end up in you know, the next uh, hi you know, historical work, uh, looking at the 21st century or whatever, but it, it allows me to focus more on bigger things and ignore some of the smaller ones. I, mean, I never thought of it that way, but on the other hand, um, I've done a couple of stories on the, the Spanish flu of 1918, and my principal research source were articles from uh, newspapers and magazines back then. Although, of course, um, we still have those newspapers, and I'm not entirely sure how people will get to World Wide Web articles 100 years from now, or whether they'll still be retrievable somehow. But it is nice to think somebody might care. Amy, does uh, you feel? Um, I feel a little bit of responsibility to make sure that we don't get so distracted by COVID-19 that we stop writing about other things, like, We've always it's it been pretty good on the diversity front, so making sure that we actually feature female entrepreneurs and people of colour. Um, so making sure we've still got that good mix um, and covering topics like sustainability or, or things that people were interested in <laughs> three months ago. Um, and, I, and we hope that they remain interested in. So kind of keeping that mix is more in my mind than it was maybe two months ago when we were like, right in the middle of this craziness. Got it. Um, well, we're just about out of time. I'd just like a quick, like, fun, uh, quick fire question for, for each of you uh, to bring it back to the theme of, uh, of, of communications, given the fact that most of the people, um, you know, participate joining this, this webinar will be thinking about how best to engage with you guys. Um, if you each had a billboard that you could guarantee would be seen by every PR and comms person uh, in the tech industry or further afield, what was the one single message you'd want to um, communicate to them? Um, not wishing to put you all on the spot, having all put you all, put you all on the spot. Um, I, I'm ready. 
Go. <laughs> Mine is, um, if I don't respond to your email, there's probably a reason. Please <laughs> never, ever call me on the phone. <laughs> that was very, uh, very straightforward. Um, <laughs> thank you, Amy. Harry? You know, the single best piece of advice is always read us. Go to our <laughs> website and our magazine. See what we cover and don't cover. And uh, give us more of the type of stuff we like and don't bother with the stuff that's not inside our world. Relevance. Noted. Danny? Uh, so, Billboard. Uh, I'm gonna, so, I have to make a maybe smaller type to get all of this in. But basically, it doesn't have to be transactional. So, the idea being that, you know, bring me some, you know, if you, the idea is that, not everything is like, oh, I've got the story here, you write it, and then that's it. It's, I'm more interested in kind of building relationships with people. So, you know, it's more about, let me put you in touch with this company. And it doesn't necessarily have to lead anything now, but like, you'll get something out of this, they'll get something out of this. And like, uh, you know, so I guess relationships or kind of the anti-transaction, I guess. Transaction. Understood. Patrick, the final thought? Yeah, I would guess I would just say like make it look more personalized. So it sounds like Amy and I work quite differently, and that's worth knowing if you're a PR person. Because like, frankly, no, I definitely don't want to be cold called, but I actually like being texted. My my text inbox is you know almost always at zero. My email inbox is at something like seventy thousand unread messages, right? So like the way to get in touch with me, especially if I already know you, oh, frankly, only if I already know you, um, is to text me, right? I mean, I mean, I especially want them to say you've uh you haven't responded to this message but like you know put your faith in me or whatever this is a really important topic or something like that and you know i mean i have to say i do respond to a little bit of uh flattery right like in the sense of i read your article and it was good but here's what's missing my client says like there's this gaping hole in the coverage of x and you know here's how he proposes or she proposes to fill it like that goes a lot, much longer way than dear, you know, and I even got one of these the other day where it said in parentheses, name here, right? <laughs> I mean, I, clearly I'm not going to read that pitch and I don't know why you'd even put in the effort to do it because um, the last thing I want to do is get enticed by something that I know went to a thousand journalists and they're all going to write it, right? So make it more personalized. I'm joking a little bit with the flattery, but... Uh, <laughs> but not much. Flattery will get you everywhere. Yeah, but hope that's a great truth, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all, Amy, Harry, Danny, Patrick. This has been a lot of fun. I think there's been some really uh, interesting, valuable insights. I really appreciate you all taking the time. I know there's been a lot of people participating and, and I'm sure they've got a lot out of it. Um, for those of you who, um, uh, any, uh, we will be putting this up on Twitter. Follow us at Clarity PR um, and this will be available to download. That's it for me. Thank you all again for your time. Really appreciate it and uh, stay well.